Welcome to the ICSS Sunday morning program at the Deeper Proctor Marxist Library, which is now held outside the library until we can get in again. So my name is Raj Sahai. The acronym ICSS stands for the Institute for Critical Study of Society, uh, which was formed at the library, Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library, in 2004 to preserve Marx's heritage and to support the struggles for social justice and the struggle for socialism, meaning leading to communism, which is our goal. The opinions expressed in our forum are only of its authors. Today is just four days past Karl Marx's 203rd birthday. And while we missed celebrating his important 20th birthday, today we will try to make up for that, at least in part. We in ICSS are united in our belief that Marx's work remains relevant. And who in his 11th thesis on Feuerbach said the philosophers have interpreted the word in different ways. The point, however, is to change it. Our speaker today is Mehmet Behram, uh, and he will speak on the theory of social revolution. Lenin, a uh, revolutionary movement's most important leader who successfully gave shape to Marx's work, said there is no revolution without a revolutionary theory. But revolutionary theory does not itself make a revolution. It is the masses who do it, guided by that theory. That theory in itself, in turn, is rooted in the reality when the conditions prevail in which neither the ruling class nor the workers can go on living as they could before. And that is according to Lenin. Such is the case today, I believe, in the US, probably Turkey, certainly in India and many other countries. The COVID-19 pandemic, I call it the capitalist commodity flu, the new Cold War heating up between the two major poles of capital, the routine police murders exposed in Minneapolis, in the case of George Floyd in the US, the crisis of agricultural production economy in India, the emergence of China as the exporter of capital competing with the US now, the attack on the Capitol building in Washington, DC, all point to a general crisis of global capitalist system, at least in my opinion. So our speaker, Mehmet Behram, is a, uh, very much an example of what Marx said. He's a revolutionary working class activist and a journalist. Mehmet is a US citizen, has been there for that way for some time, but was born and raised in Turkey. He became involved in student protests against fascism and war early in his high school years. So he followed Marx's own revolt against existing conditions of his high school days time in Germany. He successfully organized hotel workers for socialist revolutionary unions, even under a military rule when union organizing was illegal and dangerous and illegal in Turkey. Later, he became the organizer for the office workers and was elected as the representative for the 5,000 strong uh, public workers union. Uh, he also narrowly uh, survived a attempt at his life uh, with a knife attack from the hotel owners during his organization efforts. The Turkish military junta issued a search warrant for him. And Gulden, his life partner now, uh, 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 who's his life partner now, and he was, uh, he was in a wanted bulletin for his labor and worker association activities. Uh, he barely escaped the attempt at his capture by the junta, and he arrived here in the US some 40 years back and has lived here ever since then. So he writes for sendika.org, online news commentary outlet, both in English and in Turkish language. The site has been shut down for 
or, uh, or access restricted by the Turkish government 62 times <laughs> in the past 20 years of its existence, meaning it is, it is uh, on the, it's speaking about real things, but still it continues to publish. Mehmet is also a member of ICS Programming Committee of which I'm a member along with Jean and others here, Richard, uh, <coughs> Sharon. So um, please join me in welcoming Mehmet Berem. Uh, thank you, Raja. Thank you, everybody, for coming on Mother's Day and happy Mother's Day to everybody. And uh, so uh, glad that you could join us here. Uh, the, the subject came up. I, I know I have been talking about, you know, we should talk about the uh, theory of revolution or revolutionary theory for some time now. Uh, but uh, especially last week's session when uh, Jean presented the scientific socialism, it fits right into it. Uh, we had been talking about, uh, you know, doing this session, which I believe is the central question of the left today. But somehow I feel that it doesn't get into the discussions. It doesn't get into uh, being the number one issue. I'm kind of uh, surprised by that and I'm questioning why this is. I know there are some people who do that and who are working for that, but in general, the left in the United States doesn't seem to put this uh, as the number one task. So. The reason, number one reason for this session is not to provide, uh, I don't know, solutions or not to suggest you do this or you do that. No, it is to start a discussion. We need to discuss this. We need to understand where our revolutionary spirit lies. Have we given it up? Coming back to last week's session again with, uh, you know, that Eugene presented, there is an attack on historical materialism, as he very nicely put it. And people are, some people, some Marxists are no longer looking at historical materialism or even dialectics uh, to answer as a, as a tool of understanding what's going on. So... My uh, number one uh, aim here is to start a discussion and to keep it, keep it on. I am not going to badmouth or criticize the revolutions that have happened. As I understand, go and do your own revolution instead of attacking the ones that have happened, and not only the revolutions, but the movements that are uh, trying to br bring about a change. I look at change as, you know, the revolution as a point in, in change in general. So uh, that's why this is not going to be about criticizing the uh, Soviet uh, revolution or the Chinese or Vietnamese, or this is not going to be giving lessons to Venezuelans on how to do their revolution uh, or Bolivians or uh, you know, other, other parts of the world. But this is uh, to bring questions more than the solutions. I want to lay questions on the table and see where we go with this. And I'm hoping that this is not going to be the only session. I uh, discussed the matter with other ICSS members and I laid uh, 26 uh, points that I wanted to address in this session. And uh, they said 20, so each, one, each one is more than uh, you know, uh, several hours of discussion. And then since then I put a, another 10 more there. So this is not gonna be a session that we can cover everything all at once and go deep into it. Some of them we're gonna touch, but I'm hoping that maybe in the coming, uh, coming days or you know, weeks, others may join me 
in discussing the, uh, the things I'm going to be touching on in more depth. Like I would love to go into the uh, deterministic versus the voluntaristic uh, approach to, to change uh, or to uh, base it more in the dialectical or historical materialism uh, to bring more theory into the, into the social changes that we are seeing. So, uh, uh, or, or maybe bring people who are involved up to their eyeballs in the different types of uh, organizations like mass party or the vanguard or to maybe in the future have a discussion on why we are failing today we have to accept we are failing in the process of uh, creating a proletarian or a working class party. Some may disagree with me. They may say we do have one, but maybe people could come in and contribute in, in, in their experiences of this and go into the history of the Socialist Party in in United States, or the uh, you know the Social Democratic Party in the history of Germany, so those all wait to be uh, discussed. Or or you know Chinese Communist Party, how did they really organize this? And the Viet Venezuela, what did they do uh, to come to this day? So I'm uh, gonna leave it there to say that you know. Uh, this is a session of debate. This is a session of discussion. Uh, I will try to lay down uh, the views that uh, came to me as I was uh, uh, getting into, into the um, uh, revolutionary movements back in Turkey. Uh, most of the views that you're going to see here is based uh, on Mahir Chayan's uh, theories. He was a revolutionary and he uh, was uh, a theoretician also in the, in the Turkish movement. I do not fully uh, uh, take all of his views. I do not agree with him on all points. But he seems to have a point in uh, the, uh, as a guide in the neocolonial countries mostly on how to fight, how to bring change, how to uh, do revolutions. Did he fail? Yes, he did. Uh, he, was, uh, he was captured and uh, he was in prison. Uh, uh, there was an in, uh, altercation and, uh, and uh, kidnapping of the Israeli ambassador in Turkey who was killed later. Uh, he was, uh, Mahir Chan was put in prison, but then uh, three other revolutionaries faced a uh, death sentence. They were gonna be hung. So in order to uh, uh, prevent this, uh, uh, all factions in the, in the Turkish left joined forces and uh, Mahir Chayan escaped from prison. And he, uh, just for this actually, for this, because it had to be done. And they kidnapped three British soldiers from a NATO base. And uh, they were actually um, uh, uh, surrounded in a village home and uh, 10 people together with him was killed. There was one person who survived, one revolutionary who survived and who is an active uh, politician in Turkey today. And my friend uh, Steve Zasson and I had the honor of staying in his home when we went to visit Turkey. Uh, he was the only survivor. But the theories that were put together that you're going to hear today mostly comes from Mahir Chayan and his uh, view of uh, the way revolution is being uh, constructed in Turkey and probably in, in other neocolonial countries. We have to understand that dialectics is the change and things have changed from 1970s. Things have changed in Turkey, in the world. A lot of things have changed. So we have to look at these, even these with a grain of salt. But it is just like Marx and Engels in the uh, you know, 1840s and uh, even later, uh, they were wrong. Marx and Engels were wrong. They admitted to being wrong in uh, trying uh, in 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 uh, uh, predicting revolutions, and they they did self criticism. And since that time, things have changed. Lenin has come in in the age of imperialism, but since that time, things have changed. Russia is not right. United States is not. Right. Europe is not the same. So we have to understand these theories and how the revolutions were made, who made them, 
and move forward. We have to analyze the concrete situation of the concrete world with our concrete analysis, and we have to come up with solutions. I do not uh, believe that just because Russians did the revolution in 1970 that it completely uh, maps to our world today. We can learn from it. We learned how, uh, you know, Chile, 1973, what happened there. We learned from other failures and successes. We have new experiences coming up. Uh, Venezuela, Bolivia, uh, these countries are experimenting. They are trying to find ways uh, to do the change, do the revolution in their own country. So we are going to respect that. And we're going to learn from that, but we have to solve our own problems in our own locality, in our own time. Without that, we are not revolutionaries, we are not leaders, we are not vanguards of anything. So that is the task. And I'm not going to pretend that I know the answers, but to have a party is the first step to solving, understanding, analyzing the world, analyzing the situation, and making the change possible. So with that long introduction, we go to, uh, do you see the screen now, Theory of Revolutions? Not yet. Okay, uh, maybe I'm not, uh, just one minute, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sharing the screen, maybe that's why. And uh, so... That's it, share, and yeah. Okay, and I'm going to do the play. Sometimes I may come out of the program as it's, uh, you know, uh, as needed because uh, I'm also seeing that and nothing else. So anyway, um, uh, this, this presentation I prepared uh, is, uh, became like usually in my presentation, very, very, very long. And I've been cautioned by my friends to, you know, keep it in the time frame. So I'm going to go real fast. The first uh, uh, sides where I try to establish the basis of dialectics and, and, uh, and historical materialism to show that revolutions are a part of life. And in order to do that, I'm going to skip the song. I promised you the song, but no time for that. Oops. Okay. So we use dialectical materialism and to understand the world. And uh, we are going through the motions. The, the, the whole universe is change. And that change uh, comes to uh, uh, when the quantitative changes uh, accumulate and force a, a qualitative change. This is the universe. And humans, uh, human societies are a part of that too. So uh, when we come to, um, okay, just one minute, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a method to understand human societies. And in, uh, as Marx says in the, you know, people come into definite relations that are indispensable and independent of their will. Uh, these relations of production correspond to a definite stage of development of their material forces of production. I think this is something that we need to understand as Marx is trying to uh, establish a scientific base to his theories is that in human societies, the productive forces are the drivers. And the development of uh, productive forces at a certain time, when they come into a clash, a contradiction with the existing relations of production, relations of production, then we are in trouble. Then starts the, uh, uh, the uh, violent, let's say, change in the society and uh, the, the superstructure of the society, which are the relations of production, then needs to accommodate the development of the forces of production. So uh, uh, th this is to say that the uh, uh, takes place if the driver, the agent of change for the revolution is a vanguard party, that the party must study the laws of production, 
laws of development of these productive forces and the relations of production of its society. This is what I was trying to say is that every country is going to be different in time and space and locality. So the problems that the 1917 revolution faced is not going to be the same problems we are going to be facing here. So we need new solutions. And uh, so I'm going to pass these real fast, but uh, just to uh, uh, maybe emphasize that uh, forces of production, we talked about it, uh, which can be defined as total of the tools, the means of uh, means to production and the people who work on these to produce the needs of the society. This was the same in the very uh, early stages of human societies as it is today. And at a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production. This merely expresses the same thing in legal terms with the property relations within the framework of which they have opened hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters then begins an era of social revolution. So this is what we are going to be concentrating on, uh, the uh, era of social revolution. Uh, so this is uh, belaboring the productive forces that are in conflict with the relations of production. Uh, it was a very good video, actually, and it ties into uh, Raj's opening that we are now living in a world where the forces of production unleashed by capitalism has come to such high uh, levels that the crisis that Raj was mentioning, that is the crisis today. We have vaccines that could uh, save the lives of humanity, but uh, in that video I wanted to show is that Pfizer just when going into uh, a, the negotiations with the German government and European Union uh, uh, increases the price by 60%. And they are opposing sharing of the patents of the vaccines with the rest of the world. The, I don't know if there could be any better example of the uh, forces of production uh, coming to a level where uh, the humanity or the relations of uh, uh, production is left behind. Here we can provide vaccines to every single person on the face of the earth, but the prices, the trades, who's going to do pro profit from this, whose factories are used, who's distributed, these all come in the way to uh, to um, you know solve the problem. I want to say here something about the change. We are looking at the forces of production that have developed to such levels, and by the way, developed by the capitalists. The change that we want to do, the change of the new society that we want to live in, will require these forces of production that were developed by the capitalists. In the picture, you are seeing a, an Amazon a warehouse where people are forced to wear diapers. Actually, they, they, hey, they just got the uh, approval that they could wear diapers because they are working so hard that they can't even be allowed to go to the, to the uh, bathroom. Now, this is the brutal, the, 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 the wild side of capitalist production. But if we are going to have a change, if we are going to uh, live in a society where your medicine is going to be distributed to you, just like how uh, Amazon does, we will be utilizing the same forces of production, but in a different way, more humane, more better way, uh, because we cannot destroy the forces of production that have already been created. So that's why even in Lenin's time, Lenin was uh, studying Taylorism. Lenin was studying the huge corporations that had emerged in the United States in production 
uh, trying to understand how that uh, is going to pan out in a socialist uh, system, let's remember that even in socialism, energy is some, uh, something that needs to be preserved. Instead of working uh, long hours, we want to work less and let the productive forces, the machinery and everything do that so that we can come home and also, uh, you know, live our humanity. I'm going to pass this video about the unemployment. What it shows is that there are millions of people who want to be <laughs> exploited or want to work to produce, and that will provide for them and their families and the capitalists. But again, the limits of the relations of production is stopping people from producing for themselves, for the capitalists, for the, for the entire world. This is the fetters that Marx was talking about. So this is the vaccine. And... Uh, so we are talking about the forces of production and the relations of production. So we need to say uh, we need to talk about the determinant side of this. Who who determines the other one? So again, uh, to emphasize, it is the productive forces themselves are the determinants that change the relations of production. But how does that change happen? How do we come to that? How does the change? So uh, uh, this is a great quote again. The windmill gives you uh, society with the feudal lord, the steam mill society with the industrial capitalist. So that is the basis of today's world is that we have passed the steam mill. We have come to computers that Amazon, the Google, da -da -da -da. we have that level of productive forces waiting for humanity to utilize it and the capitalist system the uh, the relationships are uh, the relationship is preventing it i had all these computers and things and so on so forth so uh, I'm going a little bit fast, I know, but I want to give time to the end of the end of the uh, presentation. Now, uh, in order to understand the changes that will happen, we have to understand because we are going to get into a discussion of how to do revolutions and what to do it for. And th the central issue there is the state. So we will understand that the state is an organization not independent of the social classes that the society has. So in order to understand that uh, and, the, and the struggle against it, we have to understand the nature of the state. The state in an exploiting society is designed to protect the interests of the ruling classes. So be it socialism, be it feudalism, be it capitalism, the state is the organization of the ruling classes. So uh, this is what I uh, meant there. Uh, and we see the state uh, imposing its will and its force on it. So um, uh, will be no social change. The revolution will be complete without seizing the state and establishing the dictatorship of the new ruling classes. And that includes socialism as well. The dictatorship of the new classes will be the proletariat. So let's not kid ourselves. It will be dictatorship as well as the uh, democratic uh, for the people and the proletariat. So there's a dialectical unity between them. So is the revolution, I've been hearing this uh, discussion all my life, is the revolution the uh, seizing of the state or is it the uh, transformation from one system of production to other? Uh, Marxism doesn't have these dichotomies. It looks at all possibilities in a dialectical manner. And instead of going into the discussions of these two, you know, uh, the, uh, these two uh, points, does not pose these against each other. Revolution is the dialectical unity of both of these. So you have to seize the state and you have to do a social transformation. So in that sense, the revolution is social revolution, but it has to be also uh, uh, either as insurrection or protracted people, some kind, you have to seize the uh, state. And that is the revolution is the understanding of an uninterrupted, continuous, permanent uprising situation of the masses.
with the participation of the people, this is, I think this is very significant, is important, with the participation of the people, the state me mechanism is destroyed from bottom up. This is one side of the equation, from bottom up. You seize the state mechanism and the political powers in, a, a, attained, once you have that, then using this power, changing the relationships uh, of production top down. So there's two ways things are going. From top down, you seize the state. Uh, I'm sorry, wrong. From bottom up, you seize the state. From top down, you change the relations of production. So these changes or revolutions uh, uh, we see uh, the, uh, in the pre-imperialist uh, competitive capital stage, we're talking about that. And I must emphasize, like dialectics does, nothing fits into everywhere all the time. The uh, models that we are discussing are pre-imperialist, free competitive capitalist stage. And this, uh, these were the political uh, uh, changes or the uh, revolutions that we are seeing. Political revolution social revolution, and the permanent revolution. We're going to look at the first two and then, and then discuss the permanent revolution uh, much later. Uh, I know I said pre-imperialist, but I got this picture. I had to put it there, is that uh, what we are seeing in Venezuela could be, my, my interpretation, could be uh, uh, designated as a political revolution where you, from bottom up, you seize the state and that's it. That's the political uh, political revolution. Uh, so the progressive pro labor pro people's forces now are even that could be a, uh, that could be questioned whether the state or the government is. But uh, let's take it at the face value now. But the state has been seized from a bottom up movement, and. We are going to come to the discussion of the neo-colonial countries and the imperialism. Does that stop there? So, yeah, I don't want to get into, the, well, does Venezuela have a revolution or not? We are seeing the revolution. Revolution in neo-colonial countries, as we're going to see, is not an insurrection that we saw in 1917. Revolution becomes a long process. It's not three days, although that's what Marx and Lenin had said. So... Here is another example. We talked about the political revolution. Then let's talk about the social revolution. This is what has happened in Cuba is that once the state is seized from top down, the relations of production is being changed, has been changed. And so now we are seeing a social revolution there. The entire society is being rewritten. So in order to uh, so consciousness of the masses, this is important, ma cons consciousness of the masses and their organization skills must be very high. These are the conditions. Now we are talking about the change. Now we are talking about the uh, social transformation. Uh, just because uh, certain conditions uh, satisfy uh, the, uh, the, 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 the environment to have a, a revolution does not mean that it could happen. There are many uh, conditions that needs to be satisfied. And one, one is that the consciousness of the masses and their organization skills must be very high. Regardless of the strength and the skill of the revolutionary initiative, I'm going to be using this a lot, the revolutionary initiative. So um, we can pass this. It's a, it's a generalization of uh, what the history is done. So comes the discussion of evolution to revolution. What does this mean? It is, again, uh, I must uh, caution that we are still talking pre-imperialist era, pre-imperialist revolutions, uh, where the ca capitalist system was in that form, different now. So in that form, or in general, today we are going to talk about the same thing also, but in certain localities. Evolutionary and revolutionary phases are uh, discussed in, when we are talking about the revolutions. So uh, what happens is that the, uh, first of all, people get together for their economic democratic uh, struggles. They don't like their wages. They don't like the hours they work or so on and so forth. And, but then they start to form 
uh, as Marx calls them, combinations. And then these combinations come together as unions. And, uh, this, uh, and the struggle gets uh, uh, bigger. And then he says, once it has reached this point, at a certain point, association takes on a political character. And this is what social change is all about. The productive forces, the workers, don't like the way that the uh, relations of production is holding them down. So now they are forcing some change. Uh, this change comes in in pre-imperialist era as the short days of, as Marx and Engels wrote it, speaking in French. Why? Speaking in French is a reference to the French tradition of being rowdy, going out to the street, changing things, fighting and making revolutions and that and that. So this is what they mean by speaking in French. And this would be the revolutionary phase in that evolution, revolution discussion is that these are the short days of doing, actually doing the revolution. Um, the revolutionary crisis uh, should be there for, uh, for the revolution to take place. And we are seeing several crises that can happen and will happen and are necessary, some of them. Uh, economic crisis, social crisis, political crisis, and the permanent crisis, which we will come again later. So, so don't try to stop me after one hour. So um, necessary crisis for a, is the economic, social, and political. We must have these crises in full form, mature, and at its top for the social change, for the revolutions to take place. And if these crises have not matured, then you better not uh, uh, play around with them. Now, Marx and Engels uh, thought that the time of revolutions had come uh, when they saw the uh, 1848 through 1850, the uprisings of the bourgeois nature, bourgeois nature of the, of the, of the uh, especially France and the others, is that uh, they, uh, the, the world suffered a series of agrarian trade and industrial crises. This is what we were saying wrongly identified, Marx and Engels wrongly identified that these crises were permanent and the final stage of capitalism had come. So they expected, especially in France, for uh, the belated bourgeois revolution to happen and complete. That's another discussion, whether it's complete or not. And, but they were saying that the... Um, the, 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 the revolution should bring about the democratic environment. That's what was expected of the bourgeoisie, to do its own revolution, complete it, give us the democ democracy so that the uh, uh, proletarians can work, can uh, in that environment, can, uh, can uh, attain their own uh, revolutions. The expected revolution, this is going to be a discussion, is that the expected revolution was a permanent revolution with stages, with stages. It was not a stageless uh, revolution. It had stages. Stages meaning what? The democratic uh, uh, stage where the bourgeoisie uh, uh, completes its revolution. That opens then the uh, then the next stage for the proletariat to get on to work and do its own revolutions. So uh, there were others. I mean, Marx and Engels were by no means the only ones. I mean, everybody there wanted a proletarian revolution uh, on the left. Uh, and but the difference was that they saw the development of proletariat in Europe. To, uh, uh, they thought it had come to a maturity level that 
the proletarians could do their own revolution. Why the hell wait for others? I mean, it's just do the goddamn revolution and uh, establish your dictatorship. Why are you waiting? That's what they were saying. And uh, But Marx and Engels, on the other hand, insisted that the proletariat finish off the bourgeois revolutions and without interruption move on continuously to complete its own revolution. There was this guy that, uh, you know, Gottschalk, he was addressing Marx, and this is really good. He says to Marx, says, why should we spill our blood, Mr. Preacher, so that we could jump from the hell of Middle Ages to the side of capitalism? Why are you trying to make us capitalists? The time has come for the proletariat. But uh, the, the, uh, those went to the mistake that they were making and uh, the mistake that uh, uh, Marx and Engels later on looked at it was that the capitalism had not finished its development. The relations of production had, was not stifling the, uh, the development of the productive forces. Until that is there, attempting a, a revolution that doesn't fit into the history at that moment is disaster. So that's why Marx and Engels wanted the previous, uh, previous uh, uh, revolution to complete so that they can, they can continue to the next one. And I'm going to uh, so go for alliances. In order for the bourgeois democracy, the alliance of other oppressed classes were needed. This is what distinguished Marx and Engels in their theory of permanent revolution. They wanted, uh, they could see that the proletarian itself was not fully in charge of things. So they needed other oppressed classes to form alliances so that the revolutions could happen and continue because there were a lot of classes that were in conflict with the capitalist classes of the time. So, but one thing that was interesting is that the liberal bourgeoisie, you know, they are talking about the peasants and the petty bourgeoisie who are, you know, not satisfied with the system to be on their side, but they are keeping the liberal bourgeoisie uh, on the other side, uh, opposing it because they had become so scared of revolutions. They had started to understand that once the blood uh, starts to spill and once revolutions were on the street, they knew that it could go either way and they didn't want to risk the chance. So they became scared, scared of their own revolutions and they were not doing their class revolution. That's what was frustrating Marx and Engels, saying, no, these guys are not going to do it. I mean, uh, they should be their class, their revolution, but uh, they're not doing it. So then the proletarian revolution would not be a socialist revolution, but would be Republican social. Yeah, I have that picture. They say, oh, no, 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 come on. Yeah, but that was the, that was the, uh, 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 the criticism that Marx and Engels were facing at that time. So the uh, states, uh, uh, if, they, if, if uh, in, in this uh, completion of the bourgeois revolution by the proletariat brings in many theoretical questions. I mean, here is, we're talking about the state being the oppressive force of the ruling classes. But then the, in, this, uh, in this model that was being uh, presented, a joint state the, of the petty bourgeoisie and peasantry and the proletarians would emerge. Everybody happy, everybody in the state. But uh, Marx and Engels were really aware that even if this was done with the you know, joint forces of the state, it did not have a chance to, to flourish, to develop. So immediately the proletarian would have to step in and take over and continue the revolution of the proletariat. So that was the, uh, I think that's significant that uh, they are not just happily join, uh, you know, united in the state and life goes on happily ever. No, the uh, proletariat has its own task and has to, has to uh, go with that. So the four elements of the Marxist uh, permanent revolution was that, first of all, it 
uh, it uh, relied on the uh, permanent crisis theory, where the crisis of capitalism permanent. Then, the, uh, again, it was also based on the upcoming European revolutions. Uh, there were revolutions that had to happen and people were waiting for them. It was based on alliances. It wasn't only the proletariat, but other oppressed uh, classes could join forces. And uh, that uh, uh, once the bourgeois revolution led by the proletariat starts, it must not be interrupted, hesitate, and must continue to establish socialism with its own revolutions. So permanent revolution that Marx was talking about uh, was the proletariat, and we said that. So we, uh, again, the vulgar socialists, uh, so permanent followers, take, oh yeah, this is important. Uh, the vulgar revolution uh, only takes the proletariat as the force behind the revolution, and we see today that modern day permanent revolution followers have taken this version. Everybody was calling their, their revolution permanent revolution. Everybody, including Marx and Engels and including the vulgar, uh, vulgar socialists of the Communist League. So, the, uh, so the, uh, today, uh, uh, the permanent revolution followers have taken this version of permanent revolution and not Marxist. So again, uh, the permanent revolution today is being represented by Trotsky, and which again follows the same line that uh, proletariat doesn't need no stinking alliances. Uh, I mean, I'm making it, uh, I'm making it a little bit, um, you know, uh, vulgar there, but it, it boils down to that uh, alliances are not needed because proletariat is uh, at its maturity. So Marx understood his uh, mistake uh, in analyzing the 1848 era. And so he started studying crisis because the revolutions ba are based on crisis. We are saying if these da, 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 crises don't happen, then the revolutions don't happen. So he puts uh, his efforts onto analyzing the crisis and we start seeing them in the you know, capital. Uh, so, as we are seeing revolutions and, uh, and the way that the state is uh, responding to these, we have to understand that this is also normal. This is how class struggles go. And as is said there in Capital, force is the midwife of every old society pregnant with a new one. It is itself an economic power. This is so powerful that, you know, uh, 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 anything that is new, being born. So it's not the revolutions that are violent. It's not. It is a new society being born and being violently attacked by the uh, existing system. That is the violence. And revolutions are only, only a uh, reaction to that. So the, now we're looking at peaceful transition. Although Marxism is revolutionary, Marx and Engels were aware of po uh, dialectical possibilities. So they accepted that in some countries, like in the uh, U United States and also in England, transition to socialism was possible through peaceful means. That's very interesting. So revolutions are, as we know, you know, revolutions are not necessary in some places. Develop your capitalism and you have a peaceful transition. Another one is uh, that the uh, unequal growth in each country uh, is the result of uh, capitalism. So do we then, uh, do we do the uh, revolutions in one country or the worldwide? So uh, Marx and Engels, again, in that time, expected Germany and Britain, where the most advanced capitalism was, to be the first ones to do the proletarian revolutions. And, uh, but it was obvious that no revolution would succeed, especially in that time, uh, without the support of the other proletarians around. As Marx here says, you know, the French Revolution, do it all you like, but, you know, if you are not getting the support from England, uh, it's going to be tough. So we come to, again, the, uh, the, what is the driving force of the revolutions? Again, we are talking pre-imperialist era, where the emphasis on the revolutionary movement is on the determinist side. 
as opposed to the voluntary side, which means that what really, really drives this is the economic conditions, the historical conditions, the development of classes, the development of the productive forces, uh, what crisis there is in the society, in the world, so on and so forth. Those are the determinant uh, elements in order to uh, do revolutions. But then something happened, imperialism came. And now the whole world was turned uh, upside down. Uh, capitalism is no longer the capitalism that we knew before. Things changed. So the whole new ball game here. What, when we say change, what does it mean? The, remember that uh, what we're saying is we're saying that uh, the forces of production was still developing and the system could accommodate it in the 1840s, the system meaning capitalism. But with imperialism, that has stopped. We have to understand that that is the basis of revolutions in the imperialist era, is that capitalism is no longer under imperialism, be able to accommodate to the development of the productive forces. So, this also brought with imperialism the permanent uh, crisis that has taken over the world. And when we say permanent crisis, I mean, uh, we can discuss whether uh, uh, imperialism is actually in crisis or not. Uh, what I mean here is the strategic, strategic crisis as opposed to tactical gains that could happen. And it's happening today in, in the world. So the era of continuous crisis the crisis Marx and Engels wrongly thought existed in the 1850s had finally arrived, uh, arrived with imperialism. In that discussion, uh, we saw the second international come up. And in that development times of 18, for, you know, 1840s, 50s, even, even beyond, is capitalism is developing and capitalism was able to provide the working class and the peoples with relative, relative or not, that's in the new economy, but uh, provide with some kind of uh, democratic rights, some kind of wealth, a little bit more than what it was before. So it's, it may be apparent, it may be real, but people have uh, seen some kind of betterment in their lives. So the Second International says, hey, look, there's progress. We are moving. Things are developing slowly, but it is. No need for revolutions. What are you talking about? Revolutions and blood and streets and everything. Let things develop. Let it go in its own course and things will be okay. So no need for getting on the street. But Lenin comes in and says, uh, he starts applying the essence, the logic of scientific uh, socialism, of uh, historical materialism. And he says that the, uh, the assumptions, conditions, rules and laws of competitive capitalism is over. And imperialism now brings in conditions that also change the conditions of the revolution. And what wasn't appropriate before revolution in one country was now possible. So you could have, like uh, uh, Marx was saying, you know, the French Revolution needs the British. Uh, but revolution in one country is now available because of the uh, unequal uh, development of capitalism and the weakest link, which we're going to come to later. To wait, he says, for the working classes to do a worldwide revolution means freezing all development. This is absurd. This is Lenin talking about not being able to do, or not uh, doing revolutions in one country. Do it when you can. Do if if you have the chance. If you have the organs, if uh, do it. The world is now ready and prepared for. So the but one important uh, corollary to this is that the. Peaceful transition to socialism is no longer possible in a world with imperialism. That's the difference between, remember, the United States and uh, England or even some Germany. Uh, we could expect in the pre-imperialist era that a peaceful, uh, peaceful transition could happen, but imperialism makes it impossible. As we are seeing today, I mean, look at the way that the imperialism and, uh, you know, slides into fascism and everything. You know, thinking that uh, uh, 
voting fascist South is going to be, mm, I don't know. So uh, this is what Lenin is writing. Uh, Marx therefore excluded Britain where a revolution, even a people's revolution that seemed possible and indeed was possible without the precondition of destroying ready-made state machinery. But, uh, and then he says, today in Britain and America too, the precondition for every real people's revolution is the smashing, the destruction of the ready-made state machinery. So peaceful transitions are kind of gone. And uh, uh, so comes Stalin. And he, basing it on Lenin and the previous uh, analysis, says this is really very important, I think. Uh, uh, one of the maybe the main, main things in this presentation, the front of capital will be pierced where the chain of imperialism is weakest. For the proletarian revolution is the result of the breaking of the chain of the world imperialist front at its weakest link. And it may turn out that the country which has started the revolution, which has made a breach in the front of capital, is less developed in a capitalist sense than other more developed countries, which have, however, remained within the framework of capitalism. So now we have a complete new model in our hands. You don't have to uh, wait for the world to explode. Do your revolution where you are. Coming back to determinism and voluntarism, in the pre-imperialist era, what we are seeing is that the conditions, the, 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 uh, you know, the crisis and so on and so forth is what you wait for. Your eyes are there. Yes, of course, you build your own subjective, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, your party or that, 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 but you, your eyes are fixed upon the conditions that surround you. And that is the deterministic side of this. Without that, you are nothing. You can't do, you don't do. But now with imperialism, that condition has been satisfied. So Kenneth, it's 11.30, I just want to let you know. Uh, I would need, we, we started late, but uh, I would need a little. Yeah, yeah. I'm just letting you know. You need another 15 minutes? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay. And yeah. so the voluntarist side of, comes forth in the imperialist stage, which means that forget about the conditions and everything. They, they are satisfied. Now we have the world to do revolutions. Concentrate on your own party and your organizations. So the revolutions also have moved to the East. That's very interesting because we were expecting the revolutions to happen in the West, the advanced and so on. So, on. so how does this happen? Party, party, party. That's all there is. You have to have a party. That's the volunteerist side. That's the uh, side of that. Um, so this is a long quote from the Communist Manifesto. The first uh, sentence is important. The communists do not form a separate party opposed to the other working class parties. Well, uh, I don't know what to say today, but uh, <laughs> at least it's a nice guide for all of us to understand, especially the sectarianism that goes on in the left, which we all have, so on and so forth. Now, uh, while the economic and social factors were determinant in Marx and Engels, the politics is the more emphasized factor in Lenin. And so Leninism could be described as the preparation of the subjective conditions for the revolution. Very important. Preparation of the subjective conditions is, you know, Leninism could be that. So a party in Lenin's structure has two two sides. One is the organizational of the workers. That's very interesting. It is the occupational organization that the proletariat is going to be. But I believe in Lenin's sense is that the, it is also the organization of the revolutionaries. If we have time and we go to the end, we are going to discuss mass parties versus vanguard parties. So which one to have? So so the Leninist party has both the workers and the revolutionaries and the uh, relation of the party to class is ideological. Look, there is a break here. Uh, what the model comes up is that 
it puts more emphasis on the advanced revolutionaries. As uh, Lenin says, you know, it's not a part-time, uh, you know, uh, just come and go as you please. That You are going to be professional uh, revolutionaries working day and night. And that is the organization of the party that can do the revolution. And it is a semi-military organization. We have to, we have to look, guys, I mean, revolution is a... Uh, long or short, a military operation. You cannot uh, go unprepared. So uh, that's why the party is uh, semi or fully military, as we've seen in other cases, and that centralism takes power all only. We have seen in Chinese revolution that, you know, a party can uh, become, should become the a militarily fighting organization once it reaches a level where the masses are participating. So uh, again, coming to the alliances, should we have today is the service workers, tech workers, peasants, are they the proletariat? Are they the working class? Or should the party uh, uh, encompass them as well? And uh, we're going to see that there are differences on who's going to lead in neocolonial and uh, imperialist countries. So we talked about a national crisis. And uh, so... Uh, uh, revolution, again, uh, when it starts to happen with the crisis, national crisis, as Lenin says it, uh, starts to happen, then it has to be it has to be continued without any interruption, as we've seen, uh, you know, changing of the superstructure, the state apparatus, but that's not it. Changing of the relations of production also means uh, at a, at a superstructure uh, level, changing of the people, because we carry our baggage from the capitalist uh, days and so on. So, so it carries permanently goes on uh, to even having the cultural revolution as a necessary step. The party goes on three struggle uh, fronts, three fronts that are very important, ideological, economic, democratic, and the political. The political struggle determines the ideological and the uh, economic democratic struggles. Uh, we don't have much time. We can maybe discuss this. And so, now uh, we come, remember, we talked about the evolutionary phase and the revolutionary phase. Let me go back to that again to a discussion because it's going to be different here now. Is that in the evolutionary phase, even though your party may be militaristic or, uh, you know, has taken on the armed struggle as the main uh, way of mobilization. The tactical side of the uh, uh, of the uh, evolutionary phase is a very long time where you prepare, you organize, you educate, you train, you get arms, you get uh, safe houses, you publish, you do this very long time of preparation. That is the evolution phase of uh, social change. Then comes, as Lenin says, you know, the very short days. He says, if we had started the revolution one day before, or if we had waited one day after the October revolution, the, the revolution would have, would have failed. So very short days of uh, uh, revolution that followed the very long era of preparation, the evolution. Now, in the colonial times and in the neocolonial countries, this is no longer uh, valid. Again, this is one more thing that went out the window, is that your, your struggle has combined evolution and revolution together. The concept that this gives is that, uh, is that you do not wait peacefully, very important, peacefully for a long period until that day comes for the revolution and you grab your arms and you do the insurrection. No, 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 no. From the very get-go, the struggle is armed. This does not mean, this does not mean that the from the first day you grab arms and go, no, no, no. But you are prepared for an armed struggle your structure is that way. You have organized that way. You are ready for anything, which is, uh, this is what we should get from it. A party, a Marxist, a Leninist party, 
should not be a peaceful party or should not be an armed struggle party. No, a party is the organization of the class. If the days come when you have to carry babies on your shoulders on May Day parades, yes, you will do it. You will be able to open childcare centers. You should be able to, uh, you know, go out and give food to the people. But you, when the days come of armed conflict, you should be ready for that as well. So that is the organization that can fit any day and any attack that the bourgeoisie can have on you. You better be prepared. Otherwise, you're not a party. You're not the leader of a, of a class. And uh, so, which means that uh, why revolution, evolution together? Because as you are doing these tactically or, you know, tactically, you are actually developing yourself. You are doing the revolution and evolving at the same time. You are preparing for it. As you are preparing, you are fighting. It's not that prepare, then fight. It is fight and prepare all at the same time. So the uh, uh, so it could be in many ways, many ways for each country, separate, different, maybe similar. But it looks like in the countries where there is a huge, uh, massive pe peasant and other classes, it looks like a, a protracted people's war. Uh, so French, uh, speaking French and f speaking German is combined. I don't know, Esperanto? No, <laughs> but it is, it is the, uh, you know, speaking both languages at the same time. That is uh, uh, German, speaking German, Marx uses as, you know, uh, being cool and thinking, developing theories as Germans are good to do. So, uh, so he's combining those two. So the one thing is that with imperialism, the imperialism uh, or colonialism that used to be an external feature of countries is no longer. With neocolonialism, imperialism is an internal feature, which means that if you got to fight imperialism, it's not the foreign boots on your country as it used to be in India, in China, whatever. Uh, it's not the foreign boots. You are fighting your own bourgeoisie, the, uh, the comprador bourgeoisie, that are integrated with imperialism. That's why the revolution is not going to be against a foreign invasion, so on and so forth. Your own uh, bourgeoisie is your enemy, and uh, they also are the imperialists. They are also the fascists, as we're going to see. So uh, the reason is that the, what used to, uh, uh, used to happen before the pre-imperial you know, pre era was that uh, you had a class formation that was the uh, national bourgeoisie. In the age of imperialism, uh, yes, they, they're still, but they're not significant. They don't, they don't have a say in the country's, con uh, any country's uh, uh, formation or policies. It is the Comprador bourgeois is the bourgeoisie that are the representative of imperial, and they are they are up to their eyeballs in relations with them. So that's why in most countries there, what we call the undeveloped national crisis, undeveloped. Why? Because of imperialism. Imperialism both brings both brings crisis into neo-colonial countries, but then also brings certain developments in there that prevent the people from reacting to it, which normally they should be reacting. Normally they should be uh, getting up. They, they should be fighting like in colonial times. We've seen this in India, in China. You know, the foreign guy comes in, I'm going to fight. Da, da, da. No, but with the new techniques and developments and also some relative uh, wealth that has been brought in by imperialism coming in, there is a crisis always there, always crisis, but it doesn't mature to its full because if it does mature, then the people, uh, people would stand up, fight back, and that's not happening. So, so that's minutes. why... Okay. Two minutes. Uh, so there's uh, artificial balance. That is the uh, outcome of the immature uh, balance. So the task of the Revolutionary Party is going to be breaking the superficial balance. That is the imm you know immature, I guess, and non-developed, uh, non-developed uh, crisis, and uh, that's uh, uh, kept there. So uh, if you don't mind, can I please have five more minutes uh, to come to some real? Uh, 
metropolitan advance, this is what our, you know, where, where we are today, is that contrary to neocolonials, evolution and revolution stages are fully in effect. However, the sharpening contradictions, loss of the Soviet Union and strategic decline of the US increases tactical attacks by the imperialists. So we should be in uh, speaking in German maybe. Uh, this is up for question. I mean, we have the democratic socialists and so forth. But while this is happening because of those tactical attacks and everything, we have the blacks, both in Black Lives Matter and uh, uh, not fucking around coalition who are uh, getting prepared. Remember, remember that, uh, you know, a party has to be prepared for all days. And I love this. We are a black militia, they say. We aren't protesters. We aren't demonstrators. We don't come to sing. We don't come to chant. That's not what we do. But they are armed to the teeth. So the discussion is on mass party or the vanguard party. There are differences in, I'm not going to go into details, but I'm going to show you the last pictures. I'm at the very end. If you want to see the differences between the Vanguard Party organization and the Mass Party organization, as you can see in the Vanguard Party, the party is in the center and it creates some of its, uh, you know, uh, other, uh, other organizations around. It is in control. And those organizations are in contact with the other mass organizations like the unions and so on and so forth. And it is a very democratic, centri centrally controlled uh, uh, organization with the centralism being the uh, emphasis there. And then there is the mass party. And in the mass party, uh, we have seen that it is more democratic, but it brings other uh, problems like, uh, you know, when uh, anybody could enter, not like Vanguard Party. Uh, it's very hard to enter a Vanguard Party, but the mass party, anybody could enter and which means they can alter the policies of the party and uh, change it altogether. And uh, they uh, adhere to mostly the democratic side of it. And they are involved in very uh, uh, different levels of countries' uh, policies everywhere. And this is the structure of the mass party organization. Look at it. The party itself is in uh, is working together with the unions, the cooperatives, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you don't mind, let me go back to the previous one. Look at the difference between a vanguard party structure and how it works versus uh, the parties in the center. It has, like I would say, protective organizations around youth, women, so on and so forth, which interact with the other mass organizations. Yet here, the party itself in the mass party uh, is uh, interacting with other mass organizations. So I'm going to uh, end here. I really want people to please contribute and uh, let's discuss uh, the models that are out there, is it the Vanguard, is the anarchist, that's, we haven't even come there, a type of organizations and, uh, you know, what to do, why aren't, why don't we have a mass or a Vanguard party in the United States that's leading a struggle? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mehmet, for a very informative, very exciting presentation, very uh, very educational pre presentation for those of us who want to make change the world. So now I will ask Jean to make some announcements for our upcoming program, followed by Richard Fallenbaum for uh, Fund Appeal. And then we'll go back to uh, question and comments period. Um, our session will stop at 1230, then informal, informally it'll continue for another half an hour till one o'clock. Jean. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Raj. Let me just, um, first thing I wanna do is go to our webpage. And I think it's one of uh, Mehmet's other accomplishments over these last uh, few weeks has been to reform our uh, webpage. So it's no longer the dull and boring one you used to see. Now it is live with color and many other features. So you can go to ICSS Marks um, and you'll get the new page. And, We're in the uh, age of imperialism, that's why. Uh, well, it's the age of our, our technological progress is yeah, certainly yeah. going forward, <laughs> let me say that much. But uh, next week we have another uh, uh, program. Is Roger here? No, I think he's- uh, Yes, I'm, I'm here. Pardon? I, I'm here. 
Oh, you're here. OK, yeah. because next week we have uh, Roger Harris speaking on Biden's foreign policy, hope or horror. And do you want to say a few words about that, Roger? I'll just say a very few words. In his first major foreign policy speech, Biden said, America is back. He repeated that twice for emphasis. What does it mean to say America is back? We'll address that tomorrow, next week. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Roger. And we'll all be looking forward to that. And then um, the following week, May 23rd, um, we have uh, the significance of the Alabama Amazon union struggle, building solidarity in a time of transformation for the working class. And we've invited uh, uh, Judy um, Greenspan, member of the Peace and Freedom Party, Workers World, and uh, the local organizing committee uh, to support Amazon workers. So that will be the following week. And after that, we're still kind of struggling over issues, but uh, we will continue to bring uh, excellent programs such as you heard today. So uh, now you, over to Richard. Yeah. Richard, are yeah, you there? I just, um, just want to um, remind you, who, people who have not contributed recently, and many people do make generous contributions, but, uh, and then we forget about it. And, but we need to have some contributions, regularly financial. I put a, uh, my usual uh, um, notification of how you can contribute in the chat, either through PayPal or a check or now Patreon. Um, we'll hope to add some other um, uh, methods, but there they are. And so don't forget to make a, a Mother's Day contribution to the mother of our movement, the Nebel Proctor Library uh, today. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, Richard. And I just want to say I do monthly, I just have set up with my bank to send a check to Richard every month. And then, you, then I don't have to worry about, oh, I forgot or something. And you can make it as the amount that is affordable to you. So, okay. With that, now we go to question and comments period. And please raise your hands. And if you don't know how to raise hands, uh, Alan can uh, educate you on that. Alan, uh, uh, how does one raise the hand here? Because uh, some people may not know. No, you can uh, do that by uh, going down to your bottom part of your window. And if you have the new version, just Click on reactions, raise your hand, or you can just uh, raise your hand from the participants window if you have the older version. So, or chat me and we'll, we'll put you on the list or chat Raj. Okay, great. So at this point, uh, I don't have anybody. So I want to make a comment and pose that as a question to uh, Mehmet. Great presentation, Mehmet. So, uh, one question, uh, one comment is that about uh, the theory of permanent revolution, which I'm glad you talked about the Marx's own understanding versus what later came to be uh, Trotsky's uh, permanent revolution. And my understanding is about Marx's uh, permanent revolution is uh, is a uh, is a, it's, it's not. Uh, Physical, I mean, not geographic, but more uh, time. You know, basically, your revolution keeps moving in wherever society it happens. We can't stop, otherwise, a rollback. You have to continue until you have destroyed the entire structure of capitalism and establish a new society. And in that connection, the movement from February Revolution in Russia to November, uh, October Revolution, which actually happened November 7. But uh, uh, then the third phase of that revolution was collectivization of the peasantry in agriculture. So there was the revolution. So the revolution in socialist stages was completed by 1939, according to my uh, take. And whereas Trotsky's idea of permanent revolution was 
geographical, more geographical. Unless you keep doing geographical, it will collapse. And that's where the one uh, socialism in one, one country versus others came up. You want to react to that while we wait? And there are two more people, and I don't know which sequence they came in, but I will oh, give Laura them. is next. Yeah, Laura would be next. And then and me. Followed by Jean. Okay, Jean, uh, if you want to react to me, or it's No, fine. no, that's, that's we'll good. I mean, I think we should have a longer session on uh, discussing the, you know, the revolution theory of the permanent revolution, what it means and how it's panned out and what actually happened. Uh, so, yeah, uh, no comment. Thank you. Okay, Laura. I have a question about factions and um, the relationship between the Vanguard Party and the Mass Party and how that relates to factions, because it, it seems to me that the Vanguard Party is very likely to split up, um, you know, to have splits and then more splits and then more splits. And how, and so how does the, again, the relationship between the Mass Party and the Vanguard Party, does, can that help at all? to stop the energy that's wasted in the factions. Okay, wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, don't think, I don't think we can only relate to the Vanguard party as having, uh, you know, factions and, uh, you know, the uh, dif differences or splits and really losing a lot of energy. Uh, uh, I, I don't have a statistics on it, but I would say that the, uh, you know, the mass parties would have it more. Look, uh, when you have a vanguard party, uh, I think that the way the party has organized is that they kind of have drawn the path to the change, to the revolution, to the way that the revolution should happen there. Uh, let's say I'm making this up. Suppose that you have a vanguard party that says that uh, the peasantry is the main force, but the proletarian ideology is the leading force in, in a movement. In, that's how they see their country. I, I'm making this up again. And then there is another vanguard party who says, no, actual physical uh, proletariat is going to be the uh, main force of this organization and the change, but we don't have them yet, but we'll try to develop them. When you are joining, joining is another word, uh, uh, these vanguard parties, you kind of have already passed through the uh, stages where you yourself personally have decided whether it's going to be the peasantry led by proletarian or whether the proletarian is going to be led by proletarian with the idea they did that. So you already are in that path. You do not go to the one that you oppose. But the ma mass parties, it's not like this. It is everybody and anybody and their mother is in the, in the mass party. I mean, uh, look at it. Uh, I was involved in the Labour Party. Was it 1990s? You know, Tony Mazzocchi and everything. I mean, everybody was there. And then um, the, the, the decision came and it was very actually against the mass party uh, line from the top. Here is the Vanguard Party is the one that you should get the uh, the dictate. Let's say it is a centralized democratic centralization, but that's where the party uh, professionals decide what to do in a rising situation. But in a mass party like the Labour Party, suddenly the uh, the decision was made that the party was not going to participate in the elections. What? Where? I mean, uh, so there were splits, there were factions, they were fighting each other. So I believe that uh, in mass parties, you do still see a lot of uh, factions as well. Uh, unfortunately, we are leftists. We know how to think. We think a lot and we see the world very differently. And that is causing 
uh, most of the factions. And uh, theoretically, I mean, uh, uh, yes, Lenin and Chavez and people have uh, charted their own lines, but each of us have a different way of thinking of how the change is going to come. And uh, usually they don't coincide. Uh, I don't know, alliances, alliances, alliances. I think one way to get around this is uh, like we're trying to do is the, uh, form united fronts. I may not agree with you, let's say like with the Green Party. I may not agree fully on it. But you know what? There are some uh, issues that I know for a fact that you and I are going to fight together. So I'm not asking you to change your mind. I'm not asking you to change your party or anything, but I can come together with you to fight those issues that we see as dangerous and so on and so forth. So that's a way to, I think, uh, go around that uh, thing. But uh, yeah, it's a problem. Factionalism is a problem. And in Vanguard parties, they are not that much, uh, that much uh, uh, allowed, let me say, because again, party is a fighting party. I mean, just imagine an army going into a war with many, many factions in it. All one, one says, let's, uh, let's go into defense. The other says offense. One says, let's leave this ground. The other one says, no, let's, uh, you know, for, uh, you can't have it. So the Vanguard Party kind of represents that type of an organization, where in the mass party, you would have long discussions and everybody would participate and so on and so forth. So... Uh, I don't know. Uh, so I don't know if that answers. No, thank you. Okay, hey, Gene. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, very provocative discussion. And I know not everybody will agree with what I have to say, but I take refuge as an old union man in the old union saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So I think it's important that for people to understand what's going on and take, make an appropriate stance. So my view, uh, again, might be a minority one, but I think uh, Lenin's significance is not just that he formed the concept of a vanguard party, but that he actually formed the vanguard party. Uh, in the Bolshevik seized power, and then uh, Lenin established uh, the Communist International, and every successful revolution in the 20th, 20th century uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, in uh, Asia, China, Vietnam, uh, and also even and, and North Korea, and also in uh, Cuba, uh, wasn't led necessarily by the Communist Party, but had to affiliate with the Communist Party. Uh, uh, so I think we have to understand that it was Lenin's communist international that led to the major transformations of the 21st century, of uh, the 20th century. And I also just want to add on those lines that um, the, com the Chinese uh, talk about before and after October, because they point out that the nature of the party has to change when after they have taken power. So, uh, uh, because then it not only has to make a revolution, it's made a revolution, it has to defend that revolution, and then has to keep society, people have to be fed, trains need to run on time, all of these things, so that the function of the party has to change, it has to continue to lead the dictatorship of the proletariat, but also take care of all the needs of society. So I just want to uh, talk about that and also just mention, uh, I know a lot of people think you ought to speak in German and so forth. Some of us think we ought to think and speak in Chinese. And that was the <laughs> word that our comrade uh, Wadia made, that mm -hmm. the future of humanity will be written in Chinese, but it'll also be written in Spanish. Uh, so uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, who's, uh, okay, Amit, you're next. Please proceed. So am, am I audible? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think it's a great presentation. Actually summarizes lots of points. Uh, my uh, basically understanding is that, that uh, we also have to go to Mao. And uh, Mao basically said that, look, after the Second World War, uh, the two models, 
the first model in which the bourgeois revolutions uh, were successfully carried out and the second model was the russian one where the dictatorship of the proletariat and the poor peasantry so lenin repeatedly said that uh, this is going to be the dictatorship of the proletariat and the poor peasants uh, mao was of the opinion that uh, in colonial and semi colonial countries uh, when he wrote the essay on the new democracy his contribution was that that in these countries who are passing through the pe- phase of colonialism and semi colonialism uh, neither of these two models will work because they don't have enough uh, proletariat and therefore i mean uh, his model is the mass party model which uh, actually uh, mohammed is arguing about and uh, his uh, suggestion was that that here we need to have uh, basically the proletariat of uh, all revolutionary classes in which he included not only poor peasantry and proletariat but also uh, national bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie uh now the thing is that i mean uh, how so if you look at, look around today's situation uh, of course in uh, even in the first world countries uh who are the leading revolutionary classes i mean are they going to be only proletariat or the students are also going to get involved or we can talk about uh, you know small business people uh you know so in a uh, so that's one question the second question is that in the oppressed countries we are definitely we, f- we feel that i mean uh, uh, because the working class no longer is uh, working in a single factory in huge numbers i mean they are totally scattered uh, you have uh, we call informal labor process where uh, you know the workers they don't have uh basic single union in a single factory uh, they are so scattered that uh, nowadays even work from home concept has emerged so under these changed circumstances uh when union membership is on decline and uh, a lot of uh, workers and you know uh, even the petty bourgeoisie you, you can include i mean uh, they are working no longer in so called factories but mostly in small small factories sometimes even 10 people working in a single factory uh, and it is very difficult to unionize them so the question arises that uh, you know what kind of a party model will lead the revolution okay so we are past lenin phase we are past mao phase and there are completely new situation where the global supply chain actually dictates the mode of production in all the countries and the question is uh there has to be some sort of internationalism uh but the point is that the struggle has to be based in particular national countries and here uh, i think we don't have proper answers so i would like mohammed to comment upon these points well uh thank you amit for uh, good uh, questions and uh i mean like you uh i don't have a solution we know these are problems we have to solve these especially the last one that you mentioned and they are related actually to the first question you asked uh, so who is the working class who's going to be leading um i know we will get into theoretical uh, discussions and differences when we talk about that especially i uh, you know uh, i think stu- today students and you know the uh, some of the you know uh, service Uh, service workers and so on and so forth will be uh, on the side of the working class in the united states i don't know if the uh, petty bourgeoisie could be uh, you know ta- uh, could be taken as an ally i'm not saying they are not i'm just skeptical the reason being is that the ideological uh, clamp on people in the united states is at this time today is so strong that their class and uh, uh their class alliances i think still are on the side of the big bourgeoisie uh you are absolutely right that today especially with the pandemic and the crisis of uh you know the economic crisis which is being hid behind the pandemic crisis uh has brought them to a point where they are in contradiction with the cap- capitalism is not enough for them they are being destroyed 
They are, you know, they can't flourish. They 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 have to lose their jobs to, and their shops to uh, to Amazon. And uh, I mean, uh, just a few weeks ago, I was in downtown uh, uh, San Francisco. I was amazed. Nearly every single corner has been taken over by uh, Amazon selling selling food and uh, sandwiches. So we can see that they have a real objective contradiction with the existing capitalist system. But how to break their ideological uh, relationship to the current system, uh, meaning that uh, have they given up their hope that one day their shop is going to uh, make them rich? Uh, is it going to flourish? Or maybe they can become part of Amazon and sell to Amazon. And uh, so while these ideologies, while this, this belief is not broken, uh, I'm not so sure which side they will take. Uh, I see. I, I really think that the uh, hardest part for revolutions or to change are the uh, metropolitan countries because of their uh, so-called uh, perceived success. When you go to countries like Turkey and everything, uh, you, I mean, you, although I talked a little bit about the superficial balance or the immature or non-developed crisis that's there, you don't have to talk too much to people that the system is not working for them. So they naturally do become your allies. But this uh, ideological uh, I don't know, uh, imprisonment of the middle classes in the uh, imperialist, uh, developed capitalist uh, countries is a problem that we need to solve. And I do not have a solution for you. I wish I did. But if an organization is going to come up, say, claiming that they are the uh, party of the working classes, it has to provide some kind of a solution. And you're absolutely right. We are, in, we are no longer in Kansas. Uh, we, you know, the factories are being automated. We have uh, work from home and everything. Those bring brand new challenges to us. And we have to find a solution. I'm sure there is a solution. It's just that I, I cannot find it yet myself. We need a party to be able to address that and find how to organize those people. Okay, Mehmet, thanks. We're going to go to Rich Fallenbaum, and we're still looking for raised hands because we have time. Uh, we still have 20 minutes until 12.30, then informal. Go ahead, Richard. Well, I was just going to raise that que the question that you finished, the question of the revolution in the United States. Can we, can we uh, come up with a theoretical um, summary of the situation in the United States? I mean, obviously, that's uh, as people living in the United States, as Marxists living in the United States, that's that's the the key thing. So um, I'm just emphasizing uh, you 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 express a certain pessimism about that, uh, but I, I I don't think you'll, you you you're certainly not leaving it at that, and I. I, I and you recognize it's a big problem. But yeah, we have to do that. We have to come up with a theoretical understanding of the revolutionary process in the United States. It's going on in all countries. Um, even without the revolution itself, the, the, the process is going on. Even with the most um, uh, consolidated bourgeoisie, the most disoriented uh, proletariat and so forth. Um, so we have to find out how it's going on. Thank you. Oh, I agree. I mean, uh, no, no, no. We are not uh, abandoning uh, revolutions because as in the first part I tried to show, this is how human societies evolve. And we do have a, a revolutionary, uh, you know, it's been used so many different ways, revolutionary situation. Uh, the uh, the co uh, conditions are mature. Conditions are mature. And when in the United States, uh, you know, we have seen that uh, with nobody expecting it, some changes happen and suddenly the country, although it's a capitalist, you know, developed and well established, I mean, it's thrown into a, uh, you know, turmoil. And 
things can cha- happen. But again, going to uh, the theory of the revolution is that you have to have, especially in the imperialist countries, we go through the German German speaking era of long preparation. Then comes the. Uh, are we ready for that? Even if, let's say today that some crisis happened, like the pandemic, and the government is, you know, and Republicans, Democrats, they are all at each other's throat, and nothing gets done. The whole country has come to a screeching halt, and so on and so on. Are we ready to take over? No. Because of the, uh, you know, preparation of the party. Uh, I had a quote there, so, uh, you know, a quote there from Engels. Uh, I didn't have time to show it. Uh, that quote says that the worst thing that can happen to somebody is to take over the, uh, the uh, you know, the ruling of a land when the conditions are not ready for it. Of course, this was for pre-imperialist side. And here we are talking about uh, a non-preparation on the subjective side. Do we have organs? Uh, let's say that, uh, you know, something happened to a insurrection, revolution, not in the way of a mass insurrection, but we took over. How are we going to run the department of, uh, I don't know, uh, energy? Are we ready for that? Are we ready for the, uh, for the, for the um, you know, the sabotages that the capitalists are going to bring over? Well, can we run the schools? I think we can, but that needs a lot of organization. And what are we going to do? I mean, the, the other day I was talking with a friend, uh, you know, if by a miracle today we had the working class take over the, in Turkey, let's say that we have that, um, I would be scared. The reason is that the workers have been so much indoctrinated in Islam, in religion, that if we have it, they, they will want to change the schools into religious schools. And so much corruption and everything, and that has become the norm. That's the capitalist uh, junk, the, 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 the garbage that we have, is that it destroys people's lives and everything. You need to have an organization to stop stealing, bribery, to rapes, stop rapes, stop, stop attacking women. How can you do this when a huge pro, uh, portion of the society thinks that women are nothing but just, you know, uh, for men's enjoyment? You have, to, you have to go through that training and everything. So uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but, but are we ready to take over? Uh, I think that the, during the crisis, again, another, another uh, quote from uh, Marx, uh, there are times when 20 years of training fits into two days. That is the revolutionary phase. Yes, that could happen. When the workers start to see their power, and oh yeah, they can stop. Oh yeah, they can stop the free. They can and they can take over the production. We have seen this in Argentina. We have seen this in Brazil. In, in uh, everywhere that w- workers take over the factories that the capitalists have stopped producing, and they see that yes, oh yeah, they, we we can do production. We don't need uh, the bosses. That could happen in the United States. Yes, and it has. In like, in like in 1930s, uh, the FDR and the others really thought that we were coming to the revolution because people weren't being uh, ruled as much as the ruling classes would see. And I think that today Biden's all these acts that he is passing, uh, there's a discussion going on whether uh, you know, neoliberalism uh, is uh, now reversed to back to the welfare state. I don't think that this is just because they wanted to change a course. They are trying to prevent huge, massive uh, uprisings uh, like the, you know, happened in Minneapolis and everywhere else uh, in Portland. Uh, they, They cannot deal with it right in the middle of their own crisis. So there is a scare of people rising. But where will that go? Will it go to the uh, to the point where we want it to go? So that's where the uh, subjective condition of the party that should be organizing. 
We should have a Labour Party, massive or vanguard. I don't know, maybe both. How about that uh, for, for discussion? Can a party be both mass, mass party and the vanguard party? Uh, so anyway, uh, so those are, the, those are the issues. No, I'm not, I'm not pessimistic. I'm just saying that the time in, in the metropolitan countries, I think, are going to come after the world changes and world sees the whole disruption in other countries, especially the new colonies. The reason is that imperialism is weaker there and the contradictions are insurmountable. Uh, just, I mean, that's why we, we talk about fascism coming to world today. It's not a choice because they cannot control, because they cannot manage the uh, crisis of imperialism, crisis of capitalism, that the only thing that is left is violence. Force is the midwife of a new, uh, uh, new system being born. This is what we are seeing. The force is fascism. So uh, it is slowly coming to the United States as well. Of course it has to, but the weakest link of imperialism is in the neocolonial countries. And that's why okay. we're seeing the whole uh, South America, you know, is in flames, Middle East is in flames, Asia is gone there, so, 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 sorry. Okay, Richard uh, Wright is next. He has stepped away. Let's give him a moment to return to his desk, uh, but maybe we I'm can- I'm here, I'm here. Norma, and I just, yeah, go ahead, Norma. Okay, he's I back. Just have one, one, uh, one, hold on, Norma, he's back, uh, he's, he's uh, next. And, and that is, yeah, I've got on, a Norma. great article Norma, by uh, People's Norma, Party. Norma, Norma, Norma. Talking about go. how Biden is saying, yeah, I'm doing this, and yeah, I'm doing that, Norma. and yeah, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna, and he's not doing shit. Norma, hold he's on. Just backing Let's off speak. away from it all. Let's, Norma, please hold on. Richard's turn. Well, I'll come to you. Richard, go ahead. You're next. Oops. I'm sorry. I thought I had somebody at the door. Um, and I also apologize because what I'm about to say is going to be kind of scattered and I haven't really gotten my thoughts quite together on all this. Um, as I was going through this, uh, I, I was, I was, um, I kept thinking about how Marx was analyzing. He was he was, he was focused on his history, and his analysis was at the time was focused on primarily um, capitalism. But at that time, it was very much focused on national capitalism. Uh, even though there was even though there was international trade, the the, the development was very much. Uh, on a national level. Um, the other thing I got to thinking about was that when Lenin came along, at that point, uh, there was there was more of a transformation to, um, I, one, one of the things that, that I don't think you mentioned was that Lenin also brought in the concept of financial imperialism um, and that he was analyzing terms of, of financial uh, class struggle, if you will, uh, which is very different, very different from industrial class struggle. Uh, and as I said, this is kind of scattered. Um, the third thing is, is that uh, my friend Anne uh, Lewis got me to reading Franz Fanon, uh, The Wretched of the Earth, uh, in, which he, in which he analyzed uh, uh, well, I, I'm only at like a third of the way through it, so I, I, I want to I haven't finished off the the, the ending yet, but uh, but what she analyzed uh, liberation struggles in terms of very much psychological uh, and spiritual, and he also emphasized very much the peasantry uh, of uh, uh, colonial struggles. Uh, the fourth thing that was going through my head was that um, uh, this week I had a conversation with uh, the DSA has a here in Austin has a, uh, what they call a red square. And uh, we had a, we just had a, uh, a, a, a city, uh, a city vote uh, in which we basically uh, uh, recriminalized the homeless. Uh, and uh, 
I had to sort of take him to task because uh, they, they, uh, the, the guy is doing the presentation talked in terms of the ghouls. And the problem I had with this was one, if you think in those kinds of those kinds of, uh, of thoughts, ultimately you're going to slip up when you're trying to when you're trying you're going to slip up when you're talking to somebody, and um, the credibility. And as an organizer, that's all you've really got to do is is your is your credibility. But the more importantly issue here was uh, that. Analyzing things in terms of, of psych, psychology, if you will, uh, the ghoul, uh, gets you away from really, you know, analyzing things in terms of economic issues. And, you know, if you're trying to analyze things in terms of psychology, all of a sudden, you really don't come up with a unified way of dealing with it. Because you know, it's, it's, we're, we're about it. Okay, I'll, I'll, sh I'll, I'll just leave it at that point. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. then after you answer that, will be Norma followed by Yusuf. Please. I uh, just want to no, put no. this let in. Mehmet, I didn't have... Let Mehmet react to, to the word. Has no, no, been no, no. Good comments. Good comments. Thank you. Okay. Me okay, go ahead, Norma. Just that. There's feedback. Norma, you're echoing. You might. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm a line that I hear on, and a line that drawn twice. You, you have two. And right. You have two. Can you hear me you now? Phone, you have your phone and your computer. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah fine. Yes, we can hear okay. you. All I wanted to say is that Biden is saying he's going to do this and he's going to do that, and he's promising this act and that act, and he's not doing them. He's just backing away from them. It's just talk all the heroes, you know, Biden has one thing in his favor. <laughs> He's not Trump. Um, I agree with that. Yeah, I don't think that the system is ready to go to another welfare state as we have seen in the 1930s and you know, uh, early 40s, maybe. Uh, but yeah, like capitalism, imperialism also changes, develops, and it is in deep crisis. I don't think that Keynesianism is going to solve them, even if, even if they were to try to do it. And uh, let's uh, let's see. Uh, you know, we have to understand. I believe every month, and Alan can maybe come in here, is that every month they are printing more than a trillion dollars. The uh, printing presses are working day and night. And look at the result. What has it solved? And this has been going on for more than a year. Since last year, they've been trying to do that. They're in deep doo doo, but. They have no tools, nothing to solve because the system has come to, I believe, a uh, you know very uh, strategical uh, crisis, and in this crisis, strategic crisis, tactically they can s show some successes, maybe sometimes, but those are tactical. So we have to understand, and and the system when we're saying you know we can have tactical successes in Asia. We can have one country suddenly just like emerging as we, but as an overall strategic side, I think they've come to the end of their rope. Thank you. Okay, so Yusuf, please go ahead. Yeah, I was. I'm, uh, I I I would like to take issue about your uh, uh, fears about uh, in Turkey. Uh, you said I would fear the working class taking power because it will bring its uh, Islamist baggage. Well, that's the whole point of having a, uh, a, a party is to educate workers. Uh, if they bring their Islamist baggage into the state, uh, uh, that, uh, well, first of all, it's unlikely that they would uh, see, uh, see state power. And if they did, it will be fleeting. Uh, it will be their undoing. Uh, so that's the whole point of, of, of having a, uh, uh, a, a vanguard party, a communist party. Uh, thank you for the clarification, but that's why, you know, in the beginning when I start to say that, I say uh, miraculously. Let's say that a miracle happens and, uh, you know, so uh, we're talking about 
preparation. Yes, objective conditions are ready. The system is breaking down. And, uh, but are we ready? As a party, I agree with you 110%. We need that Vanguard party or a mass bar is something, but we don't have it. And that's my criticism. And that's the reason why the, today's session is that why, why aren't we talking about this? What, uh, uh, in Turkey, it's different. I mean, we have so many parties that we can discuss why then they are not able to bring together the masses that they had before, like the uh, Workers' Party of Turkey. In 1965, uh, nobody expected it, and they came out of the elections with 12 representatives to form a uh, 12 or 50 uh, uh, to form a group in the parliament, which means that they had exclusive rights and benefits from the government. So that helped tremendously. But we don't have it today. The Workers' Party of Turkey has like one or two representatives in the parliament. And there is, uh, you know, the progressive party, HDP, sees some uh, support. But is that because they are progressive? Is that because their basis uh, is on Kurdishness and that? So uh, they are intertwined. Yes. But my point is that miraculously, if today, not after the education, not after the, uh, yeah, if today the working class was to take over I don't know. I don't know if that would be, you know, without that preparation, without that training, without that education, we'll bring the baggage of capitalism that we learned and got and grew up in into that. So uh, it, uh, let, me, let me also say that do new systems grow and flourish in the old system until... Uh, the change is ready to be done. This was a this was a theoretical question that Marx had to deal with, and uh, you know they they believed like capitalism grew inside feudalism. So should we expect? Should we expect? And that's what Marx and Engels were right. Hey, if 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 it's not ready, it's not going to change. Capitalism cannot come until the time and the development of the forces of production is ready for capitalism to take over. Yes, that's fine. Great. But does socialism grow inside uh, capitalism? Yes and no. Uh, in 1970s, uh, the revolutionary movements both criticized the, the cooperatives initiatives because it tied people into organizations like cooperatives, which was tied to the system, which meant that they were not revolutionary. But in the same time, organizations of self-defense committees were established where people were doing uh, trials, you know, like if two people fought, uh, they, they would be tried there by the people uh, to, to take care of the roads, to take care of the schools, uh, to prepare, you know, bring coal and food to elderly people. So they were, but what was the difference? What was this a contradiction? You criticize cooperatives, and then you'd go and do the same thing. No, it wasn't a contradiction. What was happening is that you have to analyze the concrete situation with the concrete tools. If the rise of the revolutionary wave is in the agenda that day, then you cannot go against it. And the cooperatives were. Cooperatives tied the people to a systemic uh, you know, the, the production, while the defense committees, while they were doing exactly the same thing on the ground, but they were also preparing people to protect their, to protect their neighborhoods with arms. They were getting ready, you know, to share. Uh, uh, people who knew better, uh, I mean, gave, uh, uh, you know, uh, gave lessons to, to kids in the school to help them, uh, uh, what is it, you know, uh, help them with the schools and everything. But what was happening is that we were both inside capitalism, but preparing a utopian, this is where Eugene comes in, is the utopian image of socialism with its roots inside capitalism. What, that was the progressive side. You have to do that because 
the minute uh, uh, the, the, the system falls and you are there, you should have people who know how to share. You should rely on people that this is our system now. We need to produce. There are elderly people. Uh, I cannot lay on, on my back while their medicine is not delivered to them. And so that's why it's a, it's a, dialectical, a dialectical situation on whether you create, like socialism, we know, does not develop inside capitalism and take over like capitalism has done to feudalism. But does that mean that we don't do anything? No, we do prepare. That's the role of the party. Thank you. Yes, that's the role of the party. And again, yeah. my criticism, where is the party? Why aren't we talking about it? Why aren't we creating it? Why aren't we not in it? Thank okay. Yeah, Mehmet, thanks. Our time is up. Rich Johnson is next with the phone number 2841 at the end. I think that's Rich. So Rich, go ahead. But I'm going to have to stop recording at this point, okay, because we're past the time, yeah, unless somebody else wants to take responsibility for that. I have also have to leave at this, this point. This is Kit. Mother's Day. Who is this? This is Kit. I'd like to say something, but are we yes, running out Kit. of time? No, no, we're not out of oh. time. I'm just stopping the recording. Kit, go ahead, please, yeah. uh, and the session will continue. Oh, that's... Okay. Okay. Oh, that's too bad, because I had some, something to say about all this. Um, uh, anyway, um, let me start out uh, saying that... Uh... Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Prompter Monsters Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml info for information write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org